Having looked at the scope of authority or what the agent has authority to do, we've now got to look at what's required of the agent. That's what we're up to next uh, in terms of the duties and entitlements of the agent. So you'll remember that the basic uh, agency relationships require the principal to be delegating their authority to an agent to act on their behalf. And what that means is often the principal can't see what the agent is doing. Well, not all the time. It's like if you have a boss at work, they can't see what you're doing every minute of the day in most jobs. Now, this means that the agent is in a position to actually take advantage of the principal. So, for instance, if you're at the coffee shop, you could take some of the money for yourself. You might give a coffee to someone else, uh, a friend, say. To overcome this problem, the law recognises that the agent has a range of duties that they owe to the principal. Most of these are to ensure that the agent acts in the principal's uh, interests. So they're acting for the principal, not for themselves. So what do these include? Well, an agent has the duty to follow instructions. So if the principal wants something done a certain way and you've agreed to that, you must follow those instructions. You have a duty, if you're an agent, to communicate uh, relevant information back to the principal. So if something happens in the shop, you communicate it back to the boss. You have a duty to act personally. Right Now, that's really interesting. What does that mean? Well, that means you can't go and hire someone else to do your job. Right? You've agreed to be the agent, they've appointed you, therefore you have to do it. Um, you have a duty to act with care, right? Remember, due care and skill, which is uh, very similar to uh, what's required under negligence, but it's a little bit different, but you kind of get that idea, right? You've got to take care if you're going to take on this role. And this is the critical one that we concentrate on uh, in this particular subject, and we'll come back to this when we look at Duties, and, duties of directors, etc. But you have to act in the best interests of the principal. So not only can you not rip them off, you've got to act in their best interests. What does that mean? Avoiding a conflict of interest, not receiving a secret commission. They're the two that we really concentrate on uh, in this particular subject, and we'll come back to what they mean. You also have a duty uh, not to disclose information that's confidential, uh, and a duty to account uh, just means you're responsible for, for like things like funds or money that comes uh, into your possession as part of this role. So just say you're in the shop, uh, you're dealing with money, you have to account for that money, they're who you deal with. It makes pretty much common sense. All of these are about making sure that you're really doing what the principal has employed you to do and that you're not taking advantage of this lack of visibility uh, in the role and your ability to take advantage of the principal because they can't see what you're doing. But why don't we have a bit closer look at this duty to act in the best interests of the principal? So often the best way to understand conflict of interest most clearly is when something involves a purchase. So why don't we look, have a look at a hypothetical situation and then an actual case to see how it, play, it plays out, etc. What it means is that you can't be uh, put yourself in a place where your interests conflict with the interests of the principal because you've agreed to act in their interests. Okay. So let's have a look at a hypothetical and then a real situation. Now, a classic, a classic hypothetical uh, situation could be that a, uh, a principal has something to sell. Just say they've got a computer, all right? They've got a computer that they, that they want to sell. Here's my computer. And the principal wants to sell it, and they employ an agent to go and find someone to buy the computer. And just imagine that the agent says, well, actually, I wouldn't mind a computer, so I'll buy it. And so they give the principal, I don't know, $100 and say, uh, I've sold you a computer. 
So what's the problem there? Well, the problem is that the agent wants the computer, they want the computer uh, as cheaply as possible, right? Because that's what their interest is. But they have a duty to get it to get as much as they can for the computer. And hopefully you can see this is a, this is a clear conflict. You can't get the computer for as low as possible and sell it for as high as possible. Okay. So really what we have is a conflict of the interests of the agent and the interests of the principal. And if the agent really did want to buy the computer, they would need to tell the principal that that's what they're doing, right? So that the principal then knows, oh, okay, these interests aren't aligned. I better think to myself in terms of negotiating. But if they bought it without telling them and just say, look, I got $100 for it, clearly that's a conflict of interest and a problem. Um, the, this other duty not to take a secret commission is, is very, very similar. Only uh, imagine we have a third party here who buys the computer and they say, look, if you sell me the computer for $100, uh, I'll give you 10 Okay. I'll give you $10, okay? So you can see this is a commission. This $10 is a commission. And if the principal doesn't know about it, if this third party gives it to the agent without telling the principal it's a secret commission, again, you can see the conflict of interest. They should be trying to get the whole $110 for the principal because the principal is the person who's actually paying them. And they might sell it more cheaply to the third party for the, because they've got, they're going to get this $10. I mean, why else are they getting $10? If not, then they're going to sell it cheaper, which puts their interests in conflict with the principal again. Okay, so taking secret commissions, can't do that. Can't have a conflict of interest. And this, uh, our authority for conflicts of interest is Lintro's nominees. In this particular case, um, you had an agent who was actually uh, acting for both. So he had a vendor who is the seller. So the purchaser, was sell uh, the principal was selling and we had the buyer, right? And we had the agent. And so the principal has delegated the sale of land to the agent and the agent then advises the buyer to purchase the principal's land, right? To, to, to do this contract that we're talking about. So the agent says, hey, enter this contract, buyer. It's great. It's a great deal. But they did not tell the buyer that they were acting for the principal, right? The agent, the buyer thought the agent was just acting for them. Right? So it's almost like a reverse of what we might think of as agency. We have got a double, agents, double agency problem here. And we can see that the judge points out that this is a problem in terms of dual agency of the agent, okay? So we can't have a conflict of interest. In this case, there was a conflict of interest because the agent is aligned with both the buyer and the seller. So how can you get the highest and the lowest possible price at the same time? Impossible, conflict of interest. Now this idea of a conflict of interest is something that pervades business, right? That's why when you're an employee, you've got to do what's good for the employer, not for you. You can't give away free coffees if you're in a coffee shop. That might be in your interest, so you feel good with your friends, but really you're taking money or at least the stock away from the principal, the employer. Um, and so it's a central element of business, avoiding conflicts of interest.